Let me kick off by stating my firm belief that the defence of any country and the means to conduct that defence are essential attributes of sovereignty. Sovereignty cannot be delegated, relegated uh, or divided. If it is, it's lost. That is the first and most essential factor in understanding why handing control of our national defence to the EU is a catastrophic risk. If we hand over our defence, we risk losing our sovereignty and ceasing to be a country at all. The handover of our defence as part of the May government's negotiations with the EU uh, has not, as Julian said, been properly understood nor properly scrutinised, and it's time it is. Now, if I was being kind, I'd say that this is because other topics such as trade have assumed perhaps greater significance. But that part of the negotiation's focus on defence effectively create EU control over our defence and our defence forces in the widest sense, because as Gwydion Prince will later make clear, it includes intelligence and security. During the negotiations, the May government sought to lock Britain into various EU structures created in order to establish control of Europe's defence by the EU Commission. These include the European Defence Fund, the European Defence Agency and the Permanent Structured Cooperation Mechanism, or PESCO. It's crystal clear in the political declaration. Look at clauses 104 to 106 if you want. Uh, and by the way, it's an integral part of the binding law of the withdrawal agreement under Article 184. Joining all these structures would tie our defence and defence industries to the EU's rules and policies for defence and indeed foreign policy uh, and would do so by legal binding treaty. Thus, under EU law, the ruling jurisdiction, we would be, would be structurally, politically, diplomatically and financially tied into and subordinated to the defence architecture of an unaccountable body, the EU Commission. And be in no doubt, attachment to any part of the EU's defence integration scheme subordinates the country by EU law to the whole of the EU's global strategy. Unless, post-Brexit, we could explicitly annul these measures, then in simple terms, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, our ships and aircraft, our land forces and our intelligence architecture could all be directed and controlled, put in harm's way indeed, by a body which could not be brought to account for its actions. The EU Commission is not elected, British voters cannot change it at the polling booths, and yet the May government has been prepared to hand over the first duty of any government, the defence of its people, territory and vital interests, to them. It has sought to make us, in effect, a voiceless, rule-taking colony of Brussels, and I don't think that's too strong a language to use. If you doubt it, uh, read first the withdrawal agreement's clauses that deal with this, 81, 92, 95, 101 to 103, and 104 to 106. And read to the technical note on external relations on the 24th of May 2018. Where, I ask myself, and you, is democracy in this? Where's our place in NATO? Where's our sovereignty as a nation? Now, if you'll forgive me, let me go into a little bit of detail uh, about those structures I mentioned and how they challenge our sovereignty and tie us into the wider EU policies. The first slide uh, that's on the screen there shows the governments of the, uh, of governments of the European Defence Fund, which was given clearance on the 18th of April this year. That will be the central pillar of the EU's structures for defence. Now, it's only allocated at the moment 13 billion euros, but it works by leveraging nations' resources through policy compliance, members having to agree to abide by the EU's rules, and also by making grants to encourage sovereign nations to make changes to their defence budgets that further align them to the centre. And this uh, annotated slide here uh, which again will be available in the pack, uh, shows how the EU currently runs the European Defence Fund, overriding national authorities. Uh, the governance of CARD, the Coordinated Annual Review of Defence, uh, is here, agreed to by Sir Alan Duncan on the 19th of November last year, which strengthens the leverage of the EU over national decision making. The governance of wider EU defence procurement is shown here, and it links CARD and the European Defence Fund to PESCO, uh, the latter by the use of a premium from the European Defence Fund for joint programmes within the EU, and also to the EU's Capability Development Plan, the CDP, 
uh, which sets priorities and the capability de 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 development mechanism. All of these fall under the Common Security and Defence Policy, CSDP, of the, of the EU, and its participants are bound by the ambit of that policy. The European Defence Fund is therefore not some sort of club. It's a power grab, which affects not only our defence industries, but the armed forces themselves and the intelligence services. If you doubt uh, the linkages between CARD and the EDF and PESCO as part of the uh, Common Security and Defence Policy, this chap doesn't. Everything is linked to everything else. Uh, and the EU has given itself multiple levels of, defense, of influence over defence and security. The Common Security and Defence Policy at the top, the European Defence Agency, the European Development Fund, the Coordinated Annual Review of Defence, the Capability Development Plan, the Capability Development Mechanism, and PESCO. If you uh, have a look at that slide, you can see that these levels of control are shown as pillars, ironically, ranged against partnership with, the NATO, with NATO and the UN. And to get the, together, they build the EU's global defence and security policy as put into effect through the European Defence Union. The political declaration on the current exit arrangements contains commitments to the three major parts of the EU defence procurement structure. Uh, this slide uh, shows how the political de declaration links us in uh, to those pillars that I showed you earlier. Uh, page 196 of the withdrawal agreement, we should note, uh, includes the concept of replacing the Lisbon Treaty uh, and its commitments to the common def uh, foreign and security policy, uh, including the common security and defence policy, uh, with a new agreement. If we agree to and join these structures, then the political declaration is the legal glue that ties us in. Under paragraph four, uh, sorry, page four, uh, the parties agree that the UK's participation in defence internal action is, and I quote, subject to the conditions laid out in the corresponding EU instruments, unquote. Committing Britain to the framework of the EU rules uh, means that everything is linked to everything else. Furthermore, the political declaration underscores uh, this whole commitment of the U UK to structures of the, ED, uh, the European Defence Union. Uh, because it says that the UK, UK agrees to participate, and I quote, to the extent possible under U EU law. And as we can see, that extent is very far reaching, as it includes the full scope of the common security and defence policy. This is therefore all about how an unaccountable body, as I said earlier, seizes control of the budgets and resources of sovereign member states. Thus, the real power in these structures is not just how much money they are themselves allocated from EU funds, probably as much as 38 billion euros in the next three-year budget cycle, but how much they can leverage and by what means. It must surely be a matter of serious concern that our civil service just doesn't seem to understand how dangerous these mechanisms are. Uh, perhaps in some cases uh, they are fully aware, uh, perhaps they're committed to them. That in itself is alarming, but far more alarming is the fact that moves towards tying Britain into EU defence have not received any sort of proper scrutiny from elected members of Parliament. This may be the busiest time in Parliament for many a year, but the EU and our future relationship with it is the driving issue of the day, and to ignore or conceal the importance of defence in that relationship cannot pass unchallenged. Here's a letter from someone who saw and read about the defence arrangements and decided to write to their MP. Uh, the key point is that the May government had been signing up to what he calls EU defence strategies, while giving the impression that these had nothing to do with the UK. He asks for his MP's perspective, whether she knows about it, whether she agrees, uh, and asking why it's not been discussed. Well, here's the response. Uh, a lot of denials denying, for example, that an EU army is being created, although mentioning an EU army seven times, uh, not the question that was asked. Uh, but there are two key errors. Uh, it says, no such common EU defence powers can be handed over from the UK to the EU without the approval of Parliament and a referendum on the issue. There is no requirement for a referendum on simple issues like an extension of EU power over defence. Uh, 
The Lisbon Treaty tells us that a referendum is only required for the creation of a unified military called common defence. The second error is the claim that national security will remain a national competence. This line is repeated in ministers' replies, such as this one from Lord Howe. The EU Commission's own list of competencies states quite clearly that the EU has power or competence to implement a common foreign and security policy, which includes a common defence policy. Uh, our own MOD's Director General of Strategy, Angus Lapsley, is on record backing this view and saying that, and as I quote, defence is no longer a member state preserve in the EU. Uh, Mr Molinar, uh, one of the uh, advisors to Federica Mogherini, the EU's high rep on foreign and security issues, stated that, and I quote, if member states research and develop military equipment together, if we use it together and move it together, and all this is in support of EU instruments, then you can say that we have a defence union. That's a long, long way uh, from retaining national competence in defence. It seems to me that there's a high degree of persistency involved in pushing our country into these measures that's almost relentless and is determined to avoid proper scrutiny at all costs. No veto has ever been used by Britain on the implementation of any of these structures. Uh, even when this was possible, and actually it's not always been possible, as elements of the European Defence Fund were put through on qualified majority voting. Uh, this was done because in spite of being central to the common security and defence policy and the EU's defence architecture, it was dressed up very cleverly as an industrial measure. But it's much more than that. But even when vetoes could have been used, they were not. Uh, Mogherini on the 14th of May 2018, for example, was excited and perhaps a little surprised that Britain was not blacking any of the EU's moves, but rather joining them. Let's please be clear. Our elected politicians, unlike the EU Commission, are accountable to the people of this country. It's wrong, therefore, that for them to allow what amount of fundamental changes in the sovereignty of our country, in or out of the EU, without such changes being subject to the Scrutiny Reserve Resolution of March 2010, a vitally important uh, element. This resolution clearly states that, and I quote, the government has given an undertaking that ministers will not agree to draft EU policies or laws that have been deposited in Parliament until the committees of both houses have completed their scrutiny work. That undertaking has clearly been breached and Parliament has been given no measures of redress for that breach. Its effects are therefore with us. It smells to me, ladies and gentlemen, of a stitch-up. A stitch-up of the highest order. Stealthy, dangerous and downright wrong. Well, what can we, you, here, today, do about that? First, awareness. Ensure that members of Parliament are aware that they have missed the scale of uh, events and the breach of their duties and powers. Secondly, alternatives. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Gwydion Prince, uh, along with Sir Richard Dearlove and Field Marshal Lord Guthrie, wrote an alternative a draft treaty between the UK and the EU for defence, security and intelligence cooperation consequent upon our departure from the EU. They published it on the 29th of March this year and it's founded on cooperation, not integration. And third, action. Please tell everyone you can about what's being done to us and our security. Uh, this event is part of that, uh, but lobby your MPs and if you are an MP, uh, demand proper scrutiny. Lobby the MOD too. Uh, as Julian said, the materials on the VFB website in a folder with today's date, uh, but we'll also be putting out the message through social media. Uh, with a few questions in Parliament, uh, like that one, uh, we can push the requirement for pro proper scrutiny. Uh, we can also prevent those defence and security measures being once again quietly wrapped into trade or industrial deals and thus stripping our defence authority and autonomy uh, under the radar, even if we leave on, on, on WTO terms. Uh, that's enough from me, and I want to hand you over now uh, to the Admiral.